when a respected family of five disappeared from Connecticut in 2020. It didn't take long for word to spread across social media. A Facebook page called Looking for the Todd Family was filled with desperate pleas to keep an eye out and report any sightings. Then, FBI agents came knocking at a holiday home next door to the happiest place on Earth in Florida. But this is no Disney fairy tale. This is Monsters. Anthony Todd was born on September 29, 1975, to parents Robert and Loretta in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. From the minute he entered the world, Tony, as he was known to his friends, was surrounded by dysfunction. His father was a high school teacher with a disturbing taste for young girls. While his wife stayed home and looked after Anthony, Robert was having sexual relationships with 16- and 17-year-old students from his class. But these were no casual flings. Robert was engaged to a nurse from a neighboring town at the same time as maintaining a relationship with a 17-year-old who lived a couple of streets over. After several years of putting on the mask of a loving husband and father, Robert became tired of hiding who he truly was. He wanted to make the children he was involved with more of a permanent feature in his life. He had already talked to the priest who was going to perform the marriage between him and his fiancée. Now all he needed to do was remove his wife from the equation. Permanently. Anthony was just four years old when he was awoken in the middle of the night by the sound of his mother screaming. Then there was the sound of a single gunshot and the scream stopped. Young Tony looked out his bedroom window and noticed a man running down the street into the darkness. When he crept into his parents' bedroom seeking comfort, what he found was anything but. His mother had been shot, point-blank through the eye. Somehow, against all odds, Loretta was still alive. When emergency services eventually arrived, she was transported to the hospital for life-saving surgery. As the investigation into the attempted murder of Tony's mother unfolded, it became clear that Robert Todd was not the devastated husband he presented himself as. Instead, he seemed a little annoyed, even disappointed, at her miraculous survival. Eventually, investigators announced they had reason to believe Robert had coordinated the whole attack, and he had used one of his students to do the dirty work. The investigation revealed that Robert had approached one of the kids from his class who had severe developmental difficulties. He had offered to pay the 19-year-old student $900 to carry out a special assignment. In other words, Robert would give him money to shoot his wife and make it look like a home invasion. When the student agreed, Robert handed him a key to the family home and a gun with instructions on how to find the room where his wife would be sleeping. He told the young man to kill whoever was sleeping in the bed, but no one else. Before he left the house that evening, Robert gave his wife an excuse about why he had to be away from the home, just to make sure there would be no question about his involvement in her murder. The student quickly confessed to their involvement and pointed the finger squarely at Robert, and they were both charged with attempted murder. Throughout the subsequent trial, Robert maintained his innocence and denied any involvement in the plot to have Loretta murdered. He admitted that he was unfaithful and blamed his child-loving tendencies for the reason he was away from home that night, not that he was attempting to avoid being shot in the face by his own assassin. Somehow, Robert believed his cover story would be enough to convince the jury that even though he was a predator and a cheater, he definitely wasn't a murderer. But the jury didn't agree. The student was sentenced to four years in prison after taking a plea deal, while Robert was given 10 to 20 years for planning the attack. Sadly, the sentence was reduced to 5 to 10 years on appeal. To everyone's surprise, Loretta stood by her man throughout the trial. Despite receiving lifelong injuries from the shooting, including living with a bullet in her brain as it was unable to be removed, she simply couldn't accept that her husband would try to have her murdered. After Robert was locked up, Loretta moved away to start a new life. 
It took several years for her to finally come to terms with what Robert had done, and she eventually filed for divorce. She raised Tony and his sister on her own until she remarried when he was a young teen. Loretta did her best to support Tony's recovery from the incident at the same time as trying to overcome her own physical and emotional scars. But hearing his mother being shot and seeing her brutal facial injury every day knowing that his own father was responsible damaged Tony in ways which even a mother's love couldn't overcome. Initially, Tony was plagued by vivid nightmares which would leave him drenched in sweat and screaming out in the middle of the night. In time, the nightmares faded, but the psychological scars lingered. Their impact would take many years to come to light. While in high school, Tony met a woman named Megan. The young lovers grew close, and when the time came, they decided to study similar degrees at college. By then, they were spending every spare minute together. Their friends agreed they were the perfect match, and Loretta was hopeful a stable relationship would help her son overcome the demons of his past. Within months of graduation, Tony and Megan were married. They relocated from Pennsylvania to Connecticut, where they set up their own physical therapy practice. For a couple of years, they worked alongside each other to grow their business until Megan found out that she was pregnant with their first child. She stopped working after welcoming their son Alec into the family. A couple of years later, they had another son, Tyler. After a couple of devastating miscarriages, the couple were overjoyed to add their first daughter, Zoe, to the family. As a father, Tony was the polar opposite to his own, at least initially. He was faithful to his wife and dedicated and devoted to his children. He never missed a sports practice or school event, and he often volunteered as a youth soccer coach. Tony provided free physical therapy to children with disabilities while Megan was the all-American soccer mom whose every waking minute revolved around her kids. She ferried her children between activities, volunteered at the school, and supported her kids to pursue their passions for sports and music. Megan loved working in her own garden and used what she grew to feed her family. She enjoyed singing and playing the flute and piano, which were loves she had passed on to her kids. As for their children, well, Alexander was a highly intelligent boy. He loved school and was reading well above his age level. He played piano and was also learning to play the violin. But music wasn't his only love. He also enjoyed soccer and bike riding and learning new tricks on his skateboard. Tyler was the joker of the kids. He was gifted in math and was also learning to play the piano and guitar. He was a great swimmer and adored his big brother and little sister equally. Zoe was everyone's little princess. She always had a huge smile on her face, and despite her age and size, she was often the one to break up fights between her big brothers. All in all, the Todds were a loving family who were well-known and regarded by their neighbors and the wider community. As the only income earner, Tony made sure his wife and children were well provided for, something his father had never done for him. He continued to grow the business while Megan raised their children, and in time, the practice was going so well that they decided to purchase a condo in Celebration, Florida. For those who aren't familiar with the town, Celebration is a master-planned community located near the Walt Disney World Resort. It was designed to capture the essence of small-town America, with picturesque neighborhoods, tree-lined streets, and a friendly, welcoming atmosphere. Imagine a neighborhood completely built around the fantasy of Disney. Well, that was celebration. At least that's what it was supposed to be. It promised to be the kind of place where families would be happy, peaceful, and most importantly, safe. It was that promise of a joyful and carefree life which first attracted the Todd family. A few years after purchasing the property, they decided it was a little small for their family, so they began to rent it out to visitors. But trips to Celebration weren't a thing of the past. Instead, they began renting a full-size house nearby so they could have more comfortable and frequent vacations to the area. Naturally, visits always included long days spent at Disney World. Sometimes, Tony would return to Connecticut on his own to work while Megan stayed behind with the kids, especially during Connecticut's cold winters. Instagram photos from that time showed the family visiting the beach, playing games, attending piano recitals, and competing in various sports. Life for the Todds was picture perfect. Until 2011, when everything changed. Back when Megan was a teenager, she was bitten by a tick. 
That tick bite developed into Lyme disease, which is a bacterial infection primarily transmitted by black-legged or deer ticks. These ticks are typically found in wooded and grassy areas, including parks and recreational spaces. Tick bites can cause a wide range of symptoms, including fever, headache, fatigue, and a distinctive skin rash that may resemble a bullseye. If these symptoms aren't addressed quickly, Lyme disease can progress to more serious health issues, including joint pain, heart irregularities, and in the worst case, neurological problems. In many cases, Lyme disease will lie dormant for years and patients will experience no health issues until something triggers the disease and ignites the debilitating symptoms. That's what happened to Megan. After a trip to Disney World in 2011, Megan told Tony that she'd been bitten by a bug she couldn't identify. What started with an infection would soon turn into increasingly severe health problems. The next year involved several visits to the ER, where Megan was diagnosed with tonsillitis, hepatitis, and various infections. She lost weight rapidly, and with it, her once vibrant and outgoing personality. After the bug bite, Megan became withdrawn and quiet, and she struggled to even leave the house. When she couldn't get out of bed in the morning, she was diagnosed with depression, which only seemed to worsen as time passed, and especially after another miscarriage. Before long, the Todd's life in Connecticut was almost unrecognizable from what it had once been. Eventually, Tony and Megan agreed something needed to change. They wanted joy and happiness back in their lives, and there was no better place on Earth to find that than their beloved home in Celebration, right next door to the happiest place on Earth. The warmer weather had always alleviated Megan's symptoms, while the gloomy Connecticut seasons only seemed to make them worse. So Megan packed up the kids and moved to Celebration permanently. Tony stayed behind in Connecticut to run the practice, but he flew in every weekend to be with his family. It was meant to be an arrangement that gave them the best of both worlds. Steady income to support a relaxing and carefree life, just like the Celebration pamphlets boasted. Unfortunately, the plan was doomed from the start. Megan's struggle with the effects of Lyme disease and with her various health conditions didn't miraculously disappear once she started living next door to the happiest place on Earth. If anything, the reality of solo parenting from Monday to Friday only worsened her mental illness and deepened her exhaustion. On top of that, there was none of the community support or connection they had back when they were living in Connecticut. In celebration, Megan didn't know their neighbors' names and the houses were mostly empty through the week anyway. After taking care of the huge house, she didn't have the energy to get her kids involved in any extracurricular activities, and her isolation deepened rapidly. With all of the stress associated with her illness and the move to celebration, Megan was grateful that at least Tony's physical therapy business was going well. Except it wasn't. Turns out the company hadn't been making a profit for some time. That was largely due to Tony using company funds to buy condos across the country which he intended to rent out to vacationers. But the properties didn't make as much of a return as Tony had anticipated, and many of them were running at a loss. The income from the business wasn't nearly enough to run two households in different states and cover Megan's medical bills as well as Tony's weekly airfares and their expensive shopping habits. When the finances started to become a problem, Tony decided he didn't want to add further worry onto his wife. Instead, he took out a small loan to help make ends meet. But when the loan came up for repayment, Tony didn't have the cash to pay it off. So he took out another loan to pay it, and then another to pay that. Things quickly went from bad to worse, and eventually Tony had gotten into $100,000 of personal debt, on top of several hundred thousand dollars of company debt and the two mortgages for the house in Connecticut and the condo in Florida. With his options dwindling, Tony decided that the best course of action was to tell his wife exactly what was going on, drastically reduce their expenses, and sell one of their homes to try to get back on track. Wait, no wait, that's the Disney version. Tony decided that his best course of action was to cheat his way out. He started a scheme where he sent invoices to health insurance companies and the Medicaid program for physical therapy treatments he had never delivered. When the money came in, he would pay off some of the short-term debts. By then, he had more than 20 loans totaling hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the insurance payments were never enough because Tony had done nothing to reduce his outgoings. 
Then the insurance companies began to grow suspicious about the number of hours of therapy their customers were requiring. I'm sure that their questions stemmed from a genuine concern about the health of their customers and nothing to do with money. Either way, in early 2019, investigators from the FBI became involved. They interviewed several parents of his young patients who had complained to their insurance companies that they were being billed for five sessions a week when their kids had only been seen by Tony once or twice. Other patients had moved out of the state and hadn't had appointments with Tony in months, and yet their insurance companies were being billed for ongoing treatments. Another insurance company was billed for $24,000 in treatments for an injury that had healed several months earlier. Those claims prompted agents to carry out surveillance at the two clinics Tony was operating out of. Almost immediately, they noticed a discrepancy in the documentation Tony had been providing when claiming for patient treatments. He had invoiced them for physical therapy sessions on days which the clinics were closed. On a single day during the surveillance period, Tony billed insurance companies for therapy services to 16 different children, all without opening his doors. When Tony was brought in for questioning, he denied knowledge of any fraud or malpractice at his clinic. But with direct testimony from patients that they hadn't received the sessions their insurance companies had been billed for, there was little he could say to convince investigators of his version of events. Eventually, Tony had no choice but to admit he had been falsifying insurance claims. He told agents that Megan had no idea what he had been doing or the amount of debt they were in. He agreed to plead guilty to any future charges, so long as Megan was left out of it. By September of 2019, Tony's physical therapy license had lapsed, and within weeks, both of their clinics had closed for good. His employees received no notice of the closure, and many were left with missing paychecks. Despite the evidence demonstrating he was committing fraud, Tony was not yet under arrest. Just before Thanksgiving, he told investigators he was going to Florida to visit his wife and he would return in early December to answer any further questions they had. Thanksgiving came and went, and soon early December turned into mid-December and then Christmas. But there was no sign of Tony, or Megan and the kids for that matter. That's right about when Tony's sister first voiced her concerns that she hadn't heard from the family. Usually, they kept in pretty regular contact, but she hadn't heard from either Tony or Megan for weeks, and she was getting worried, especially because they would always be in touch over Christmas. She called authorities in celebration and told them she was primarily concerned about her brother because she knew he was involved in a fraud investigation in Connecticut. She didn't know the exact details, but she did mention he made a couple of strange comments the last time they spoke. In that conversation, Tony told her that Megan and the kids had all come down with some kind of bug and hadn't gotten out of bed in a few days. After that, Tony had never called her back or returned her messages. That left her wondering if whatever illness they had was even more severe than Tony had let on. The sister asked the local sheriff's department to carry out a wellness check on the family to at least give her some peace of mind. On December 29, 2019, deputies knocked on the front door of the couple's home in celebration. There was no response from inside the house and no indication that the home was occupied at the time. Mail was piling up on the front patio and the lawn looked like it hadn't been mowed in weeks. Deputies noted on their report that the family had probably returned to Connecticut. It would take two more weeks before anyone realized the entire Todd family had been right behind that closed door the whole time. On January 13, 2020, investigators from the Department of Health and Human Services and deputies from the Osceola County Sheriff's Department made another visit to the house. They had been knocking on the front door for three days without any response from its occupants. By then, the house had an eviction notice posted to the front door, and authorities were convinced the family had not returned to Connecticut. They had also heard through Tony's sister that family members had been receiving disturbing text messages from the couple's cell numbers. At the same time, a federal agent investigating the insurance fraud had followed Tony's trail from Connecticut down to Celebration. They had been trying to track him down since he failed to contact them in early December, like he had promised. An agent was parked outside the home, carrying out surveillance when he noticed the front door open and Tony step outside and take a seat on the patio. Finally, they had eyes on their man. 
The agent called in the sighting to the local sheriff's office, and deputies arrived minutes later to arrest him on the insurance fraud charges they'd been chasing for the prior three visits. But fraud wasn't the only thing on their minds. They also had a responsibility to check on the welfare of Megan and the kids after the concerning text messages and the fact no one had heard from them in weeks. Here's what happened when officers approached the house. Tony's general state and the fact that the house had a disturbing smell wafting through the front door meant his answers about Megan sleeping and kids being at a sleepover weren't going to be adequate. They needed to see Megan with their own eyes, and they were about to. The officers entered the home, walked up the stairs, and opened the door to the master bedroom. By then, the smell was overwhelming and identifiable. It was the smell of rotting human flesh. As soon as they stepped foot in the room, it became clear where the smell was coming from. On a bed in the middle of the room, they noticed two feet poking out from under a blanket. When the blanket was pulled back, they found the decomposed remains of 42-year-old Megan, 13-year-old Alec, and 11-year-old Tyler. On the dog bed in the same room were the remains of the family dog, Breezy. Four-year-old Zoe was nowhere to be found. It was clear the bodies had been there for at least several weeks, and disturbingly, it appeared as though Tony had been sleeping on the bed next to his dead wife the whole time. It was only when forensic investigators began the gruesome task of removing the bodies from the scene that they discovered where little Zoe was. Her body was found on the bed alongside her brothers, but her remains were so badly decomposed they had effectively melted together with those of her mother, whose body had been placed on top of hers. Once the bodies were discovered, officers attempted to question Anthony about what had happened. That's when he admitted he swallowed a whole bottle of Benadryl just before they arrived. He was transported to a medical center, but it was determined that the amount he had swallowed was not harmful. Once he was medically cleared, Tony was taken to the local station where he was questioned the following day. Meanwhile, the medical examiner's report specified that all of the victims except for Zoe had been stabbed in the abdomen. Their causes of death were homicidal violence of unspecified means and diphenhydramine toxicity. That's the key ingredient in Benadryl, which is a common cold and flu medication in the United States. The medical examiner estimated their deaths had taken place sometime in late December around Christmas time. Initially, Tony denied any knowledge of Megan or the kids even being dead, but he quickly cottoned on to the fact that claiming not to be aware of four dead bodies in the house where you'd been living was beyond belief. Finally, he revealed the truth about what had happened inside the family home. Tony said that Megan and him had made a death pact because of their shared fear of an imminent apocalypse. He refused to admit that the apocalypse only came about because of his own actions. Tony detailed how Megan had supported him as he went into the bedroom of each of his children and murdered them. He suffocated Zoe with his own body weight and stabbed the two boys before suffocating them too. Then he watched Megan as she attempted to take her own life by stabbing herself in the stomach. When that didn't work, he smothered her as well. So I went into Zoe's room. And it took me two or three hours sitting there because it was, it's a tough, 
but the everlasting salvation, the thought of that everlasting salvation was there, and I needed to save her soul in order to be with us. So you didn't lay on her? I did lay on her. When she lay on her belly, I'm sorry. I laid on her to keep her down, and I put the pillow on top. Okay. So now, Zoe is deceased. And what happens next? Walk out. Just, um, uh, sit with Megan in the room for a little while. Consult each other, whatever you guys have to do. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? We go into Alex's room. Alex's room? Yes. The one next to the staff in the one upstairs. One upstairs. Okay. Yeah. We walk in. He's on his back. She holds, she's just sitting there holding his feet together. We're just in there. Just eyeing each other. Just gaining the confidence, I guess. You know. And I go to, I, I, I stabbed him. And he started kicking. I was trying to get up. And he kept rolling. So I ended up putting a, there was a pillow there, and I put a pillow in the back of his head so he wouldn't hit me with the back of his head. And I reached around with my hand and held his um, nose in his mouth. Where did you stab, where did you stab him? The, in the stomach, the same spot. At the end of the interview, Tony's hands and neck were photographed due to the presence of bruises and small marks. In light of Tony's confession and evidence from the scene, he was arrested and charged with four counts of first-degree murder. Prosecutors immediately indicated that they would be seeking the death penalty. It should have been a cut-and-dry case. They had the murderer and his confession. But once Tony was locked up, he realized he didn't actually want to spend the rest of his life in prison. So he decided to change his story. To do that, he first needed to point the finger at an alternative perpetrator. From inside his cell, he sent a 26-page letter to his father detailing a new version of what went down inside the Celebration House. Tony wrote that he knew exactly who was responsible for the murders of his children and the family dog, his wife, Megan. He wrote, quote, I'm 10,000% innocent of all these preposterous charges. Long story short, she gave them the Benadryl slash Tylenol PM pie, separated them, woke up at 11.30 p.m., stabbed and then suffocated each one. At the news of this, I ran into the bathroom and puked. I was weak. He went on to say that on the night the murders took place, he had driven the family van to their nearby condo to carry out repairs and collect a Mickey Mouse necklace for Zoe. Just before he left, he played basketball with the boys on the driveway while Megan baked a pie for the kids. After carrying out the repairs on the condo, he had slept in the van because the essential oils Megan used to help her symptoms irritated his sinuses. When he woke up the next morning, the vehicle wouldn't start, so he had to walk home. When he got inside the front door, he noticed a half-eaten blueberry pie on the counter, which he said smelled strange. He called out to Megan, and when she came downstairs, she looked eerily calm. She told him she had a vision of the end of the world. Then Megan confessed that she had killed the children to release their souls. Tony wrote that after Megan murdered the children, she took her own life. She stabbed herself in the stomach, drank a bottle of Benadryl, then stabbed herself again. He had begged his wife not to hurt herself and tried to stop her, but he didn't have the strength to overpower her. This despite being at least twice her size. Throughout the letter, Tony painted himself as a helpless bystander to the murders of his children, and he even wrote that he tried to contact the authorities, but he unfortunately couldn't find a working phone in the whole house. Logically, rather than leave the house to get help after the murders, he took the bodies of his wife and children to the master bedroom. He put them in comfortable sleeping positions on the mattress, covered them with blankets for warmth and protection, and left them to rot. For the next few weeks, he carried on with his usual routine, including sleeping in his marital bed until authorities came knocking. Tony wrote in the letter that he had attempted to take his own life multiple times by consuming large amounts of Benadryl. His most recent attempt was the day investigators finally entered his home. Throughout his time in jail, Tony also gave varying versions of the murders to his sister. They regularly spoke on the phone, and obviously all of those calls are recorded. 
In one call, he said he had no recollection of the crime up until the day he got arrested. It was all just one big blank. I don't remember anything pretty much over Christmas and the first week I got here. I don't remember coming here. I don't remember anything um, after the events what happened and all that kind of stuff. I have no idea um, where I was, where I am, and the only thing I remember is being at the hospital. I guess before I, I assume before I got here, and I remember she was talking about charcoal, fifth floor, and counter, and that's all I remember. And I will remember waking up here and seeing uh, one of the officers that uh, I've become pretty close with. Other than that, I have no idea anything. I'm very, very worried about you. I want you to know a couple of things. That, uh, that I absolutely love, honored, and obeyed, Megan. Everything. With this in mind, it will come as no surprise that when it came time for Tony to enter his plea deal on the four counts of murder, he pleaded not guilty. During the trial, the prosecutor opened with the versions of events most in line with Tony's own confession immediately after the bodies were found. Tony had murdered his 4-year-old, his 11-year-old, and his 14-year-old children, and his wife and the family dog. Not because he feared the apocalypse, and not because he wanted to free their souls. Because he was a monster, and likely because his shady financial dealings were about to be brought to light. Tony's family provided some insight into his mental deterioration in the two years before the murders. His sister spoke about how the family had been so close to the community in Connecticut, but once they moved to Celebration, they were almost like hermits. They didn't participate in neighborhood events, and rarely left the house. During that time, Tony put on a significant amount of weight and was diagnosed with diabetes. She also noticed that he became more secretive about his work and money. The murders themselves were described in explicit detail with the prosecutor stating, quote, The defendant went into Zoe Todd's room while she was asleep. He took the time to sit with her and then he rolled over on top of her until she suffocated. The defendant was more concerned about Tyler Todd because Tyler was the fastest. He was afraid that if something didn't go the way that he wanted, Tyler would escape. When it came time for Tony to give his testimony, he started by attempting to show himself as a grieving husband. When he was asked to describe the history of his relationship with Megan, which included going over her health history, he was tearful at times. But whenever he got deep into explaining the medical terminology, he was cut off by an objection. Watch how his whole demeanor changes every time he's cut off. Let me ask one thing at this point. What was the status of Megan's health when you first met her? When I first met Megan... <sighs> Sorry, I just need to collect myself. Megan had initially been diagnosed as a teen with Lyme disease, in which was... They say Lyme disease goes into remission. They say Lyme disease goes into just recesses and waits another day to invade, all depending on your immune system, all depending on what research shows and who you follow. She also was diagnosed right around middle school, right before I met her, with a heart issue. This heart issue they diagnosed as mitral valve, uh, mitral valve prolapse and a murmur. They also diagnosed arrhythmias. At which time I found out after I started dating Megan in high school, because I asked her one time, we used to go out to dinner all the time, we used to, you know, normal dating. Th ask your next question, Mr. West. I'll try and ask you more questions that have a shorter answer. Huh? I apologize, sir. And then in the ensuing year, did Megan develop any other health complications? Oh, yeah. Through... Um, <clears throat> Many trips to the hospital, they found that she acquired, through the medical aspect, what's called drug-induced hepatitis. So her liver became inflamed. It was malfunctioning, um, to put it lightly. I swear her eyes could... Objection, Mr. Toe? Yes. 
Notice how in the span of seconds, he goes from tearful husband to a confident expert to clearly pissed off by the rude interruptions of the lawyers. On the stand, Tony repeated his claims that he was innocent and that Megan was responsible for the murders of their children. He told the jury that after traditional medicine failed to help improve her symptoms, Megan had become heavily influenced by a religious group she met online. That influence led her to believe that the afterlife was the answer to her physical ailments. This religious group would be conducted mostly by Skype or whatever um, video thing it was at the time. I think it was Skype. Objection here, sir. No, I... But the means of technology overall. Thank you. I would sit with her during some of these meetings. They would give her prayers to pray whether for, to help with what they were talking about with what was called family lineage karma burning. Because as in the Bible, Roman Catholic, the same thing she followed was the fact that your past, um, what's the word, your, your past family's transgressions followed forward multiple generations. So her, as you asked, the, please repeat your question just so I can make sure I repeat correctly. Was there an afterlife component of this, of this religious practice? Yes, there was an afterlife component in which each afterlife, she believed that there was reincarnation. And as they burned the family karma in the current life, they reached a salvation in which they were reincarnated to a better life. And was her desire to seek better health through this process by going into another life? Better health and better relationships with people who had, abused her and had verbally and otherwise affected her in her life. Tony went on to tell the jury the same story he had written in the letter to his father, blended with the version he told his sister. That he wasn't actually in the house when the murders took place, and he didn't recall ever giving a recorded confession. Describe what you know or saw, and not what you heard from another person, if you can. Thank you, sir. When I came home that morning, I knew my family the night before was having dessert, and I declined it because you saw my health. I was jogging and losing weight. I came home that morning, and there was a melted purple, looked like a pudding pie. I, I can't really tell you exactly what it was. She told me what it was later, but it was in a graham cracker crust. And the, the kitchen, it was my job to clean the kitchen. But when I came home, that purple, bluish, grapeish, melted pie, I guess you want to say, a pie dish was sitting there on the counter with some residue on the kids, um, at the kids' places on their, on their plates. My house was very quiet. Very unnormal having three kids, one 13, one 10 at the time, and the other one four years old. She brought me in the room. I had been feeling nauseous that morning anyways because I had these shakes I was taking for weight loss, all that. And around the same time that she was telling me I was puking. It was then that I understood what had transpired. She had blood on her shirt. And after that, after I said a few uncolored words to her, I then discovered the kids. I went into the rooms and found them dead. <laughs> Last thing I remember was falling down the stairs and smacking my head on the stairs, which I resulted in a fracture of my neck. Next thing I knew, I woke up here. And seeing that video yesterday, I don't even, that was the first time I saw that video. I had no agenda consciously, but I can tell you throughout my relationship with my wife, especially after she got sick, I would put myself as a forefront and take responsibility and protect my wife.
His testimony also referred to a note, apparently left by Megan, which he became aware of after she had murdered the children, but before she took her own life. Um, were you aware of any suicide note? <sighs> when I came back to the house that day, she showed it to me, yes. But I had no, no knowledge of it before I came home that day. Tony's testimony was in direct contradiction to the recording of the interview he gave right after the bodies were found. The video of his confession was played to the jury despite his lawyers attempting to argue that it should have been ruled inadmissible. From the outset, Tony had told the police that he and Megan had planned to kill their children for some time. They had researched what kind of knife to use and which technique would be most effective for killing their kids. He also discussed that after the murders, he had sent messages from Megan's phone so people wouldn't come looking. He spoke about suffocating Zoe first and then moved into Alec's room. He said, quote, I stabbed him and he started kicking, was trying to get up and tried rolling. I reached around and held his nose and mouth, and he was rolling and kicking and eventually stopped. Interestingly, Tony was very clear that he wasn't responsible for killing the family dog. That would be a step too far. There was, it was noticed uh, during yesterday's uh, events that the dog was stabbed. I didn't do that. But I mean, it doesn't matter. No, no. I just let you know. Okay. Shockingly, Tony also stated that the children were well aware of their imminent deaths. He claimed that as their parents, Megan and him had made sure to get their consent before murdering them. He told officers that all the children wanted was to be with their parents, even if that meant joining them in the afterlife. The taped confession also answered the question about when the murders had taken place, two days before Christmas. On the stand, Tony claimed he didn't know what he was saying when he gave the confession because he had fallen down the stairs and hit his head. Right. Then he said he confessed because he wanted to cover for his wife's actions and he felt guilty for not protecting his children. He also spoke about his many attempts to join his wife and children in the afterlife by taking his own life. You said in the statement that you stabbed the children and there was blood everywhere. Do you remember that from yesterday's video? I remember it just seeing on yesterday's video. I wasn't aware of anything I said till about June, so maybe June or July, six months after I got here when I got the transcript of what I said that day. Why did you say that you um, that you performed the knife, the, the incisions on the bellies of the children? It goes back to the aspect is I was covering for my wife. Obviously, unsuccessfully, because as you saw by the video, compared to what they said, I had no clue had my kids died. Did you have ideas of joining your family in the afterlife? After I saw everybody die? Uh, after I saw my wife die and saw my kids? Most definitely. I wanted to be with them. That's the only thing I wanted to be. I didn't care by what means. I didn't care by what anything. I sliced my wrist. I took multiple doses of Benadryl. I tried to hang myself several times. I bought a pellet gun to shoot myself because I couldn't get a gun to, as you call it, eat a gun. Did you ever try to um, poison yourself? With Benadryl, yes. And also, I was just under recently of medical care, and I was given metformin for diabetes. And at one point, I swallowed the whole bottle of metformin. He then answered questions about the night of the murders. After telling the jury that he went over to the condo to carry out some maintenance, he described falling asleep in the van. About what time did you usually eat dinner? It depended on what activities it were. That night, probably about 5-ish, 5.30. Some nights at 8, some nights at 7. It all depended. So, what happens after you play basketball? 
I told the boys it was getting late. Megan had told me that she wanted to go to bed early that night because everybody had just gotten over the Christmas, uh, sorry, the, the stomach bug and didn't want to be sick for Christmas. Okay. So I said, go on to your mom. I'm going. Good night. You know, I'm going over. Just remind mommy I won't be home. I'll either be sleeping in the, the condo or the, um, what's it called? The studio apartment above the garage because I was a bull in a china closet. You saw how big I was. I was a klutz. How do you get back to the condo? I walk. And you, what tools do you bring with you? It was a tool bag full of, there's, um, what they call soccer wrenches, wrenches, screwdrivers, a, a gross array of all tools. I had a utility bag. Okay. So you carry the utility bag and you walk over to the condo, right? I walk over to the van. That's correct. So how long are you sleeping in the van? I woke up by the sunshine the next morning. So you slept the entire night in the van? I'm sure I woke up at one point or another and went back to sleep. It was not uncurrent. I used to fall asleep in the um, pickup line to pick up my kids at school. Okay, so did you sleep in the front seat, the passenger seat? Front driver's seat. seat. Front driver's seat, okay. Did you ever go inside the condo? Nope, never made it up there. Why did you drive over to Longview Avenue in the first place then? As I repeated it the first, which was already said, I was bringing stuff back from the condo that were of my kids that they wanted back. Obviously, I'm not going to carry a whole bag of whatever in my hands, so I brought the van to load in all the blocks, load in my, some of the kids' my Lego, their Lego toys, bring back some of the stuffed animals. Okay. It's interesting to consider Tony's language here. Where was Tyler? Tyler was found downstairs. And was Tyler in the library? Yes. He was asked where Tyler was. He said, quote, Tyler was found downstairs. Notice how he didn't say, I found Tyler downstairs. He's describing the events like he's telling a story from an outside perspective. Because that's what happens when you make stuff up. Your brain treats it like fiction, because that's what it is. He also has a magnificent recollection for someone who apparently blacked out and doesn't remember what happened. Tony repeatedly stated that Megan had all the phones in the house, so he attempted to get help by yelling out the window. When that didn't work, he visited a local store to buy a gun so he could take his own life. He also gave a different version of the events surrounding the note. The contents of the note included statements like, quote, We as a family decided this course of action of salvation for several reasons, and, quote, We are seeing the end of the world prophecy coming true, and we choose not to have our family suffer and be subjected to foreseen tortures, cataclysmic demise, and continued agony. The family will no longer be separated, and Tony will be with us always and forever now. It also referenced that through death, Megan would be free of pain. It said, quote, Being together forever without pain and suffering is our ultimate goal and want. It also stated that the family were proud of everything they had achieved together. Quote, This was a decision we made as a family. Now we will be together forever without pain and suffering, and we will watch over and protect all of you. We love you all. In Tony's taped confession, he stated that being the helpful and thoughtful husband he is, he printed the note out from his phone after he and Megan wrote it together. Did you guys leave any notes or journals or anything like that. We left a note trying to explain what we did. You guys signed that? No, we just typed it up and printed it. It was already printed? Mm -hmm. Was it printed when Megan was still alive? Uh, no, I printed it after Megan was alive. We wrote it up together. And, and I just didn't print it before. Did you print that off of which computer? Was it a My phone? Tower? It was a phone. Your phone was connected to a printer? Yeah, you can air print. Oh, okay. But on the stand, he retracted that statement and gave a rambling alternative story about typing it up so her final wishes were clear. You spoke about the note that was left. That's correct. And you told law enforcement that you printed it after Megan's death. Correct. And you testified here today that that wasn't true. That's correct. And that wasn't the first time you told that to law enforcement, was it? Well, actually, let me correct your, let me correct the, the facts on that case, please, if you may. The initial note was the one I didn't print out. The note I found in my pocket after, which is the note Meg printed out, that I found in my pocket after I urinated myself in the, in the garage after one hallucination and drank what I thought was coffee, but I'm pretty sure it was motor oil. I went into the house, 
stripping and found the note in my pocket. Which note? The note Megan had left. What was on that note? On that note was essentially, I didn't read this note, but from what I recall, it said we did it to the family, which she referred to as family lineage. I had a different relationship, a different definition of family. And the other thing was where she wanted her ashes. At the bottom of that note, it said, Tony, I love you forever. Please forgive me. What did you do with it? What did I do with that? Yeah. I took it out of my urine-soaked pants and retyped it because I wanted, the, I wanted my res residual family or my leftover, uh, the family that was alive, to keep the knowledge that we were a family unit. And I wanted my wife to know, I want my wife's wishes known where she wanted the ashes buried. She wanted to be buried with her father where we released the ashes at Harkness. When it came time to discuss Megan's death, Tony reiterated that she had stabbed herself twice in the stomach after consuming a large amount of Benadryl. But medical experts noted that the downward angle of the stab wounds on Megan's abdomen strongly indicated someone else was responsible. In the taped confession, Tony said Megan begged him to kill her after the children were dead so she could join them in the afterlife. He claimed that she said, quote, if you love me, you can do this. I want to be with my babies. That truly is the tale of two versions. By the time Tony took the stand in his own defense, he was completely dissociated from the murders. Even as the lawyers for each side gave their closing statements, it was clear Tony was a man far removed from the facts. But the defense's version of events had clearly left the jury questioning whether there might be an element of truth to Tony's claims that Megan was involved in the murders of the children, at least. After four hours of deliberations, the jury let the judge know that they were able to reach a unanimous decision on some of the charges, but not on others. There was a very strong chance that the deadlocked jury would result in a mistrial, so the judge ordered a recess in the hopes that a break would enable indecisive jury members to reconsider their opinions. Thankfully, he was right, and after four further hours, the jury returned their decision. They found Anthony Todd guilty of four counts of first-degree murder and one count of animal cruelty. In the judge's sentencing remarks, he called Tony, quote, a destroyer of worlds. He sentenced Tony to four life terms without the possibility of parole. In a landmark ruling, Tony was also given one additional year for animal cruelty for killing Breezy. After victim impact statements were given by members of Megan's extended family, Tony stood up and made his own statement. Of course he did. He said, quote, this is a personal catastrophe in everybody's life in my family, including myself. I maintain my innocence. I love my wife. I love my children. I was not there the night my children died. Unsurprisingly, he immediately appealed the sentence. It's difficult to know how much of a role the attempted murder of Anthony's mother played in his actions all those years later. In the wake of the trial, Tony's father, Robert, spoke to the media. It appears as though he sides with his son's version of events, saying, quote, If you look at how he was and listen to what went on, there's a lot of things there that didn't make a whole lot of sense. It just didn't seem right. You can't take someone after a tragic situation and expect to basically get the truth out of them. It's distorted, and it's not meant to be, but it is. Tony doesn't remember a whole lot. It doesn't seem as if he was competent during that time. Robert stated that he didn't have a relationship with Anthony after Loretta's attempted murder, but since the murders of Megan and the children, the father and son are closer than ever. <sighs> of course they are. I guess the monster doesn't fall far from the tree. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.